Ted, you uh, have lived in Israel uh, for quite a while. You're a daily student of the events that are taking place. You follow the Israel's war with Hamas and Gaza very closely. You have followed the ceasefire efforts in Egypt and then France, uh, John Kerry's uh, Turkey Qatar event there in, uh, in France, uh, and then the eventual ceasefire deal. You followed the donor conference recently. You've heard Ban Ki moons statements and also John Kerry's statements that, uh, you know, again, once again, I guess it doesn't surprise us what he said. Uh, where, where do you see things uh, today and what in your heart do you see coming forward with this scenario that we're living uh, here within Israel, in Jerusalem? I'm going to discuss a present um, reality as a backdrop to going back to the ceasefire process. Um, the political, uh, political right in Israel is demanding that Netanyahu lift the unannounced freeze on construction and start building, and they're putting the, the government at risk <coughs> if Bibi doesn't lift the freeze. And Bibi is the biggest, Netanyahu is the biggest bulwark to right-wing policies. He's preventing them. He's definitely middle of the road. So that's the first problem. And he's, in answering to these people demanding that he build, he says, we can't build because of international constraints. Now that word tells you an enormous amount. Bibi is cowed by international pressure. So let's go back a bit to the wars going on. Uh, Obama played more hardball than the media let everybody know. And not only did he shut down Ben Gurion Airport for a day, unprecedented in any other country, in any other situation similar, but he put an embargo effectively on the resupply of Hellfire missiles, I think they were That's called. That's correct. That's right. But it was an embargo on all resupply, not just the missiles. So here, <clears throat> Israel is trying to fight a war and making policy, and ultimately uh, Bibi took a lot of flack because he accepted a ceasefire. And people don't understand how much pressure Obama was putting on him in terms of not resupplying, in terms of Europe was coming out and applying sanctions, all kinds, all coordinated by the White House. So my feeling is that when Bibi's ending the war on what many people feel was a bad footing, we didn't finish the job, we have to lay at Obama's doorstep. Okay, that's number one. Uh, number two was that um, one of the big issues in the ceasefire was that Israel and Egypt were working toward creating their ceasefire, which was basically only a ceasefire, no commitment, no concessions, no whatever, just a ceasefire. And then 30 days later, we'll sit down and see what we can work out. On the details on border restrictions. On uh, whatever, on what yeah. flows and, and whatever. Right. Now, they fought hard with uh, uh, Obama, who was working with Turkey and Qatar, Qatar, I'm not sure American, but, Either uh, way. Yeah, to, uh, to have America and Qatar superimpose the ceasefire that they wanted. And they wanted to give Hamas all kinds of stuff. And in that particular instance, uh, Bibi, because he had the support of El Sisi of Egypt and Saudi Arabia, they hang, hung firm, right? And he got it on his terms. You know what's so amazing, and I, and I really think this, uh, you know, this honest broker thing with the United States and Israel has always been a given. Yeah. But uh, the fact that the Egyptian came up with a ceasefire agreement that Israel agreed to, the Arab League agreed to, and virtually everybody in the EU and the, at the UN, uh, well, actually, I can't say UN because there's some nations that wouldn't go along with it, but for the most part, the world leaders went along with the Egyptian ceasefire agreement, except for the Palestinian Authority says, no thanks. So then John Kerry uh, says, hey, let's do a conference in Paris. He brought in Turkey and Qatar. They basically, uh, it's like Hamas wrote the, the agreement that was done in Paris. And then it was submitted to Bibi's cabinet. 
Right. And they said, no way, unanimous. Even Libney and others said, forget right. about it. Yeah. So, you know, really this honest broker thing, I think that's uh, that it's was biased. a breach. It's Abs- biased. Absolutely. absolutely biased. Because he wanted Qatar and Hamas in there. And Obama has always backed Hamas, even although they're a terrorist organization in the U.S. Uh, at the time of the flotillas. Well, they, I think maybe that gets back to it. We talked about this before, but the fact that the Muslim Brotherhood have uh, in America have seven people in key positions within the Obama well, administration. Uh, and also the fact in that June 4, 2009 Cairo speech that uh, Obama gave to the the Muslim world, which was carried on Qatar Station, sure. Al Jazeera, and others, um, you know, he insisted that the Muslim Brotherhood have a first uh, have a first row seat with Mubarak. And Absolutely, and Mubarak didn't show. Exactly, he didn't, he didn't come to him. But that's how the ceasefire ended. But it's not the end. All of a sudden, Israel started to reverse their long-standing policy of keeping restricting Hamas in Gaza, which they originally did it with Bush. They were both together on bottling in, uh, bottling uh, the, the Hamas in to Gaza. And all of a sudden Israel reversed that. And Israel was starting to allow the United Nations and, and brought in Air, uh, uh, Abu Mazen to supervise. And all of a sudden, all the things that Obama wanted in his ceasefire Israel was agreeing to. And here in Israel, we're saying, it's a 180 degree turnaround. What happened? I thought we got the ceasefire on our terms. So I think that after that happened, after Israel got it on its terms, Obama really put the screws to them and recovered. So they set up the donors conference and 2.5 million, whatever, and all of a sudden, Israel is changing their entire policy. And another thing Israel was adamantly against... Or the $5.4 billion, uh, Israel, ultimate, was, yeah. Israel was adamantly against the reconciliation between Hamas and, uh, and Abbas and Fatah. And all of a sudden, they weren't against them. And that's Obama again. And I am sure... like It's such a 180-degree turn. I am sure that it's Obama not giving up. And then Kerry comes out with his, oh, it's so important, we gotta have a piece of blood, and on and on and on. Now, I have a friend who's a professor in Mexico. He studies this all his life. And he writes to me, he says, Ted, you've been writing all the time, that's the end of the two-state solution. And then he says, look at Kerry and look at this. And I, I said, as far as Israel is concerned, it's the end of the two-state solution. Now, they did a poll recently recently in Israel. I don't know if you noticed it. 75% of non-Arab Israelis are against the two-state solution. Yes, yes. Dramatic numbers. And also the splitting of Jerusalem. And Yeah. Well, I, I shouldn't have just simply said the two-state. They're against the two-state solution with the 67 borders and swaps or with the division of Jerusalem, or with Israel pulling out. I mean, they, those are red lines. 75% is enormous majority for a fractious Jewish community where you always have, you know, six million presidents, as they say. So, uh, and then Bibi comes out with a statement. He's got this uh, uh, freeze. What is the freeze all about? Why is he? There's the, no, set, the housing freeze in the settlement communities of Judea. Yeah, scenario. if you think about it, we were given the choice at the beginning of about a year ago, at the beginning of the, uh, of the nine months, we were given a choice of in order to start negotiations, we had to make a concession, which boggles the mind. Who has to pay somebody off to sit? I mean, it boggles the mind, but this is the demand that they're putting. And we had a choice between releasing. Uh, uh, prisoners with blood on their hands, or doing a freeze. So Bibi staunchly said that um, we're, we're not going to freeze and we're going to release prisoners instead. So he releases the prisoners, and then he freezes anyways, except then with an official freeze. This shows you how weak Bibi is. Although he's a wonderful foreign minister, he goes to the States, you know, and they, everybody in America loves him, yep. but he's too complacent or compliant, he's too 
he caves all the time. He doesn't stand strong. And uh, it, it's, that's what we're up against. You know, that scenario there is, I remember uh, former ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren, yeah. uh, just before the ceasefire talks even began in Egypt. Uh, this is uncharacteristic of him. He basically told John Kerry, stay home. And yeah. you don't have a history of really any success in the Middle East, and we don't need your help right now. And when, and right about right after that, that's when we had that 24-hour freeze on Ben Gurion Airport. Yeah. And that's when Senator Ted Cruz says, "I want the notes. I want to know specifically who gave the order, who gave the order, how it was done. I want the chronology." And then it went quiet. But it was very interesting timing, to say the least. And then all of a sudden, John Kerry. Uh, gets on his horse and comes to the Middle East and, you know, he has a history, just like Michael Lawrence said, of not a lot of success. And it seems like, and even this is even Dana Milbank of the Washington Post and other uh, journalists in the U.S. and in Israel know that um, that uh, Kerry has a really big ego. And there's even... Well, let me some... go one step further on, on that exact point. Here we have America giving Israel advice all the time and Europe giving Israel advice all the time. What have they done so right that gives them the right to give us advice? And why should we follow their example? Very well They've put. They screwed up with everything. Very well put. You know, if you look at Europe, look at the problems they have with the Muslims in their society. And they want to tell us how we should organize our society here. I mean, it's nuts. Why would we follow their example? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and, and America, like you said, the seven people in the, in the Homeland Security, see, I, what the, whatever, all these Muslims that uh, Obama has laid out the red carpet. And not only is he allowing thousands of illegals to come in uh, through the South, he has invited Muslims to come in, I think close to 100,000 a year, and green carded them and, and whatever to get more Muslims in America in order to affect American policy more. Yeah, Ambassador Patterson, a former ambassador to Egypt at the U.S. Islamic Conference a couple of months ago, uh, she was a keynote speaker. She said that there are 80,000 Saudis in U.S. universities now to the tune of $4 billion a year. Tuition. Tuition being paid by the Saudi government and it was just they thought it was just a matter of time before they hit that hundred thousand student marker. Yeah. And we've also know and we also hear we also know that the Saudis are helping fund a lot of the Middle Eastern studies uh, departments totally. in some Georgetown key, and whatever key totally. universities in the United States. So uh, this situation is not getting any better in the United States. Uh, you have a demographic problem with uh, Muslims in uh, in Europe, uh, you know, country after country. I studied that recently. It doesn't take a high percentage. It, exactly. You know, exactly. it's like France is five percent only. You know, I mean, it's really low percentage. Yeah, I think five. I think France is now at ten percent. There's sixty, the sixty-two, sixty-three million right. in France. There are about six million Muslims. Yeah, about six hundred thousand. Right. That's Jews. the number. So, uh, uh, and yet they dominate society. They force legislation. They do all kinds of things. And then after a while, like what happened in Lundestan, they just said, "Okay, fine. You just." We'll just let okay. you monitor and, and handle your own area. We'll, we'll leave you alone. And, and well, that's, that's been for a few years now. That's correct. That's um, correct. But let me, let me talk about ISIS because it has to do with the Muslim Brotherhood that you're talking about. All of a sudden, um, uh, I didn't mention this to you, but David Horowitz from Front Page mm -hmm. Mag, uh, he wrote an article and the title was Thank You, ISIS. And what he was saying, he says, for years, he and his type, have been trying to alert Americans as to the danger of Islam to Americans and couldn't get any traction. But because of the beheadings of ISIS, they're now getting attraction, attraction and Americans are waking up to just how brutal the, I could say extreme, this is Islam, mainstream Islam. Correct. You know, this is in the Quran, this is basic stuff. Well, it's, it's, uh, they're following Muhammad's pattern. Totally, totally. And, the, and they're commanded to do that. So, and I say, you know, unfortunately, America's focusing on the danger, on the violent jihad, and they're totally asleep regarding the stealth jihad in America and I think the stealth jihad is like a Trojan horse and is far more dangerous to America than the violent jihad. Yeah, I, I, th I, I agree. I remember how 
uh, right after 9-11. I mean, literally, uh, and I read a couple different articles on this, seven out of 10 Americans were depressed and could even be considered clinically depressed by what happened on 9-11. Wow. Soft underbelly, uh, mm -hmm. if we'd had another event or two after 9-11, it would have been really hard. Uh, I remember when they had the uh, the shoe bomber incident. Uh, that was a close call. And then the American Airlines plane blown up uh, over Queens as uh, Yasser Arafat sitting there at the UN. Um, you know, a lot of Americans were really concerned that this uh, this might be the end of air travels. We know it in America. There was a lot. It of, was in a sense. Uh, Look at all the you know for, with shoes and this. Oh, for, and absolutely. That. For a while, you know, one shoe bomber tries to take down sure. American Airlines flight out of Boston or outside of Boston, and you know, three, four, or five million shoes have been taken off ever since. So, uh, you know, it's a situation where Americans unfortunately have a soft underbelly. And I know there's a lot of concern about this issue. And I think, obviously, the greatest concern in America is a series of, of terror events. So we're already having a few, uh, whether it's at Fort Hood or whether it's in Oklahoma City or outside of Oklahoma City the other day. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big concern about these events happening. And they see what happened in Canada? Yes. And, and, and as far example. as Americans, there's no difference. That's right. If it's going to happen there, it's going to happen in no, America. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And I think the... Uh, Americans are beginning to wake up that uh, this could be a very significant problem. And, and obviously, a lot of uh, I was reading the uh, White House press report from the last um, uh, press, uh, press briefing, daily press briefing, and the, the major media were really hitting uh, the White House press secretary, uh, Josh Earnest, hard on this immigration issue and what's, you know, who's coming in the border? I mean, what's coming in on the border? I mean, how, is this are they focused on Islam coming in the border? Uh, or they're just saying who's coming in? A little bit of both, but uh, both. But there are, I think, more and more the Fox guy, Ed Henry, and others, uh, you know, other people in the White he's House. He's good, by the way. I like he's, him. He's a, he's a good guy and he does a good job, asks good questions. And I think they're beginning to connect the dots that, you know, we're hearing some stories from. Uh, Congressman uh, Duncan Hunter, you know, he, he served in Iraq. His father was a, uh, uh, a congressman uh, where he has talked to Border Patrol people that have arrested over 10 ISIS people coming in, attempting to come in our southern border. So it's, uh, it's a situation, obviously, it doesn't, as you're alluding to, Ted, it doesn't take a lot to create a lot of havoc. And well, but beyond that, uh, you know, there's something very, very basic about the values of Islam compared to the values, the Judeo-Christian values in America. They are incompatible. They, and so here people think that we can digest them, accommodate them, bring them in. You can't. They're incompatible. And that is a huge hurdle for Americans to say, we don't want, like they did with communism. They had no trouble excluding communism. Why can't they exclude Islamism? And yet, the left has taken over America to such an extent they're defenseless. Well, there are cities like Dearborn, Michigan, that has a large Muslim population. Uh, you know, Washington D.C., Baltimore area, I understand, has over two hundred fifty thousand Muslims in that area. And you know, I have some friends that work at the White House for Middle Eastern uh, news organizations that are wonderful people. They're very good, uh, decent people. We have a great relationship, but it's the ones that follow the the Koran uh, or who vote in polls that they support Sharia. Uh, yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, and I think that uh, what happens in the United States, uh, Americans are just not up to the fight. And, and those that are attempting to infiltrate America, whether it's through the teaching of some of the mosques, yeah. um, they realize that Americans are just not up to the, uh, up to the fight. Uh, we're seeing some uh, situations you know, in the... It is so much easier to understand the 30s when Hitler was arming and Hitler's was pushing and nobody wanted to, they didn't have the stomach for the fight. It's the same thing. People don't want to, and I understand that. Yeah, oh yeah. I understand that. But reality tells you that you got to take a stand and you have to draw your line. Well, and, and I think that's what's unique about Israel. Israel has the attitude we can't defeat them. So we have to manage it. We have to manage, the, right. manage the problem. And I think they've done it very effectively. They understand it because this is their neighborhood. Uh, There's but, still a lot of voices. Oh, yes. Calling for defeating them. Yes. But that's what surprised me about Obama stating that his goal was to destroy us, uh, I'm paraphrasing a bit, destroying ISIS. I mean, wiping them out. Talk is cheap. You know, it is, but I wonder, Ted, that's uncharacteristic of a guy that's very politically sensitive to how he speaks and the words he uses, because that's almost like... 
using a sports term. That's locker room bulletin board talk. When you're playing a football game against an opposing team and someone from the opposing team says something about you and you put it in the bulletin board to motivate you. Those words coming from the President of the United States is destroy pro- Islam or destroy ISIS is what he said. Yeah, we're going to destroy them. That's our goal. That's our purpose. Uh, and probably one of the best possible recruiting tools is those statements by itself. And I recruiting I'm, for ISIS, you mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he even said it. Uh, he also said we're going to destroy Al Qaeda. Yes, right. Uh, not quite as is. Uh, yeah, he did. But it, this one seems to be a bit different. And yeah, because they've acquired a lot of territory. Well, they have a lot of territory, finances. and they have the weapons, and, and they, they have, have the oil, and, and the in the oil, and the money, and uh, there's even concerns that they pay, they are inside the U.S. I mean, that's obviously a, a great concern. Um, obviously, Israel's got a, a a northern border that started to heat up. Uh, there's been some concerns lately about. Um, Hezbollah situation, although it's kind of interesting, is ISIS is basically acting like uh, Hezbollah is just nothing. They're nobody, and we're going to wipe them out. So that that could be an interesting conflict in itself. But uh, any feeling, Ted, one way or the other uh, about the situation on Israel's northern border, possibly in Lebanon, Syria? Well, first of all, first of all, when you clear away the fog about ISIS and how they got started, and and. All the America has to say, we're going to train Iraqi. Who trained ISIS? Well, well nobody trained that's, ISIS. Yeah, that, that's right. That's, that's that's like I'm going to have a royal commission to study the problem. <laughs> it's it's putting it away. Who trained ISIS? Nobody. Well, exactly. The United States did train the Iraqi we're coming military. To. Twenty uh, sixty five thousand soldiers. Yeah. Twenty five billion dollars in ISIS comes to town. They go into hiding, throw out their uniforms, and. Or join them. Uh, That's absolutely. an example. Who would follow American advice? And here, America and Europe thinks that Israel should follow their advice. I mean, it's, it's bizarre. Um, but coming back to ISIS, Saudi Arabia wanted to stop the Iranian hegemony because they're Shiites. Right. And the discussion at the beginning of the Syrian war was a discussion uh, about who do we train? How do you identify who the moderates are, the Free Syrian Army? And America doesn't know anything about who's who. That's for sure, right? But Qatar and Saudi Arabia wanted to create a force that could deal with it, and they kept backing ISIS. And whether America was too, I don't know, because if they can get ISIS to do the fighting and take Assad down, that's great. So I think America is ambivalent about do they want to wipe him out or do they want to let them wipe Assad out before they wipe him out. And then you could throw in the Turkey component too that would like to see Assad overthrown. And, you know, during some research recently, uh, the, the whole beginning of the Syrian conflict had to do with Turkey holding off water because they're the yeah, you know, they're yeah. the OPEC of the Middle East when it comes to water they have a tremendous amount of water resources yeah. so they were holding off sending water to Syria which was making it real mm-hmm. difficult and that was almost some people believe the catalyst to this recent conflict well uh, it started out with the drought by the way in northern Syria yeah uh-huh. that's where the war started exactly because right. that water wasn't delivered uh, and I wrote an article a while back that I'll put out the sound bite for you I said the blood of 200,000 Syrians is on Obama's head. Mm. Why? Here's why. Obama, without real justification, decides to interfere in Libya in partnership with Qatar. Uh, and Qatar got a motion of uh, no fly zone or whatever because there was one rebellious tribe. If, a, if Obama had stayed out, Gaddafi would have suppressed the tribe and, uh, and you have your uh, stability again. Uh, we know what happened in Egypt. Now go over to Syria. Uh, and what happened was, once again, Assad could have dealt with that, and Obama and Qatar decided they're going to make it a bigger deal. So they made it a bigger deal, and they didn't finish it off. They, it was half-hearted, but they made it a big enough deal that 200,000 people got killed. And if Obama had backed away to begin with and let Assad stay in power, that 200,000 people would still be alive today. Yes. That's... 
Or a so, lot of a lot of those. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so what? And so and he there might have be, killed ten thousand. And there right? would be six to eight million people that have been uh, uh, forced sure. from their homes. And sure. Yeah. So you know what Paul said when they were going into uh, Iraq? He says, "If you break it, you own it." This this is prime example. And so, as a matter of fact, so that's an article I wrote anyways, indicating that Obama was putting his weight into instability rather than stability. Because stability, you support Assad, you support Mubarak, you support... But he wanted instability, and he wanted the Muslim Brotherhood to take over, and Turkey is aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas, and Turkey is the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. And Syria was part of Turkey. Yes. Right? And yes. what a way to get it back. And as we know, uh, Erdogan was Obama's newfound best friend. Right? A few years ago, he, yes. he praised him. Absolutely. First, uh, first public speech in the Middle East was uh, April 2009, uh, when Erdogan gave Obama the opportunity to speak to the Turkish parliament. That yeah. was his speech when he said Islam, uh, there are moderate, uh, moderate Muslims, and that's when Erdogan rebuked that statement. But, you know, and Erdogan does not like the Kurds, or especially the PKK. You know, that's been up in Kobani. That was the big issue right there on that border issue. Right. And, you know, NATO is saying, hey, Turkey, get your tanks in there. Get in there and do they something. Do but they, they didn't. A, the NATO issue is, a, is an issue that, we'll, we'll leave that aside, but something happened today of interest. Now, you mentioned that the PKK in Turkey, they're there and they've had a lot of fighting in the last three months and, and the peace process so-called uh, disintegrated because of that. Um, uh, or maybe the, the, the peace process disintegrated before that and that's why the violence was there. But Turkey has been cultivating relations with the Iraqi Kurds. Okay. Oh, a, a very Big time sub business. substantial business. Substantial. Yeah, right? absolutely. So he's, now, right. just today, might have been yesterday, uh, there was an announcement that the Iraqi Kurds were going to be permitted by Turkey to come into Kabani and support the Kurds there. Very interesting. So that's more the Peshmerga uh, yes. Kurds rather than the PKK, which are considered right. pretty... And part and parcel very interesting. with that very interesting. is the resupply of weapons, because they don't have the weapons to fight. Yes. Even if they had the map, they don't have the weapons. Absolutely. So America started with the weapons and screwed that up also. Um, and they want us to take their advice. So uh, yeah, by uh, dropping the weapons to the to the ISIS uh, Islamic State rather than to where it was supposed to go. Well, uh, at least some of they've them. only owned up. That, uh, yeah, owned up to part. Yeah, one one drop, I guess. But but, at least. but in any event, that's good news. And, and if that news includes the ultimate creation of a uh, a Kurdistan state, that would be a great success. And Kurdistan could be an enormous ally of America and of Israel because they're pro-American, they're pro-Israel, and, and Obama's been against the Kurdistan. And in a really, a lot of ways, they already are allies. I know there's oh, a, yeah. a, you know, it was interesting, I met some of the Kurdish leaders in Washington about 10, 12 years ago, and they sincerely, when I talked about Israel, they you could sincerely uh, see the favor in their eyes about Israel. They really liked Israel. They For liked many it. decades. Uh, this goes back. It's all the way. It was incredible. I saw that firsthand. I was really impressed. And, and the fact that uh, my Christian friends who do work in northern Iraq uh, really, really like the Kurds. They love them. I mean, yeah. even to the extent they're, of... They're somewhat modern. They're Sharia law. Forget about it. Absolutely. Very yeah. special relation. We have friends that have been in and out of there recently in Erbil. Uh, yeah. that just really love the Kurdish people. So, and you know, it's always ironic is that the Turks are about business. You know, a lot of their relationships are based on, you know, can we make money off this? And and the Turks have made a tremendous amount of money uh, trading with the Kurds that have a lot of oil, uh, oil money up there in right. uh, northern Iraq. So, yeah, that could be really interesting. I know the Iranians don't want to see an independent Kurdistan. I mean, or they just don't want to see yeah, it. Yeah, because they got their own Kurds to worry yeah, about. It, yeah, exactly. And then uh, if the Turks went along with that, boy, that'd be, that's interesting because you, we really have kind of a opposing caliphates here. You have the Iranian Shiite caliphate right. yeah. uh, with Hezbollah and Abbas, or, or Assad, and then you have the Turkish caliphate uh, where Erdogan really 
sees himself as a future major Middle East leader. Yeah. So uh, that between it's either him or Obama. Oh my! I well, think Obama he... wants to be the the caliph of uh, the caliph of the new caliphate. What else is he going to do after being president? So <laughs> well, th- be that's what's so interesting because I, I know that uh, you know a big problem was the U.S. weapons were going to uh, Maliki and they weren't ending up in the Kurds' hands. That was part of the plan. Is you know we give the weapons to Maliki and he will distribute them to the Kurds and. He wasn't getting it done. He wasn't doing it. So uh, I think we're distributing directly more and more to the Kurds now, which is essential in order to be able 100%. to... 100%. You know, they're great fighters if they have the equipment. That, that's right. Absolutely. Uh, that's the answer that Obama's been avoiding. Now he's just starting. And I think what's been happening is there's all kinds of political discussions going on. And part of those discussions are with Iran. Because I just read a statement this week. Iran committed to Maliki and the Shiites in Iraq. Don't worry, we're going to defend Baghdad for you. They've got a vested interest in stopping ISIS from taking over Baghdad. Absolutely. And we don't hear any of that. No, no. And it was interesting is because Iran was basically looking at the United States and, and the allies to basically do their battle or do exactly. their war for them. And it ha- exactly. they haven't been very effective. So all of a sudden Iran's worried about Baghdad and also worried about Assad's future. I That's mean, he, right. He could be taken out at any time. And, and America, because they are kissing up to Iran. They are maybe turning 180 degrees and they want to cut a deal with Iran and they want to, to deal with the... It's a mess what's going on. <laughs> it's a disaster. It really is. I mean, this is it's, one convoluted, complicated yeah. mess. Yeah. And uh, I had a good visit with Mordecai Kadar the other day and he was talking about, you know, he's the, as you know, Ted, you know Mordecai, uh, talking about the tribal factions yeah. throughout the Middle East and we have a lot of tribes fighting each other. And he talked about the United Arab Emirates. It's been successful because one tribe controls a city or an area. And That's what tribe, he believes in. Yeah, and, 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 he, and it's really, when you don't have opposing tribes fighting each other, you have somewhat order. A uh, lot of order, because yeah. the clan system, the yeah. tribal leader, everybody obeys. Right? Yes. Now, I just read an article today from Professor Inbar, Ephraim Inbar, uh, that's a Bessa Institute. And he was talking about the... Uh, uh, the British French plan to create states in of the former the Ottoman Empire. Right. And they had absolutely no idea what they were doing or should be doing. And ISIS now and what's going on, everything that Britain and France created is finished. Uh, so the uh, Sykes uh, the, the agreement. Sykes Picot. Yeah, Sykes Picot uh, agreement. Everything is wiped out. All the it's, states that, that that agreement established yeah. is in total chaos. There's, I mean, th- there's no such thing as Iraq anymore. There's no such thing as Syria anymore. And what's happening is dividing into these ethnicities. It's not down to the clan necessarily, but it's certainly uh, in terms of Shiites, in terms of uh, Sunnis, uh, and this, they don't breach opposition or um, uh, they are so committed, the, the Muslims, to unity. This is the whole system. Is everybody has to, you want to leave the religion, we'll kill you. Like, this is very authoritarian and sort of uh, authoritarian. And that's what they're all about. A strong leader. That's what they're all about. And they want a strong leader. They don't want democracy. They don't want our values. They don't like our values. So uh, what's happening now is that they have unity among the Sunnis or unity among the Shiites. They love unity. They don't want any discordant note, right? And so this is what's happening. And this is what Britain and France learned a lesson. And this coming back to Israel is that I even wrote an article about, and it was not easy to write being a Westerner myself, uh, separation versus integration. Now, if you go to America, everybody talks integration, multicultural, blah, 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 whatever. And I said, well, we don't live in the Western world. We live in the Middle East. And maybe the answer is separation, not integration. So we shouldn't take an American value. For instance, uh, there was a community of um, uh, 400 Jewish families who wanted to have a religious community. And an Arab put up by the various left-wing Arab organizations made application to live in this community with his family. And it went to the Supreme Court. And Supreme Court was going to force this community to accept this Arab family in the community. Now, that is the law in America. 
but it doesn't work in Israel. It's too disruptive. And uh, so the idea comes along of separation. Every, everybody wants to be separate. You look at the Muslims in Europe, separation. No. They don't want integration. No. So that's another Western value that the West has to clue in. Yeah, even Germany, I think it was Angela Merkel said recently, this multicultural thing is, uh, has yeah. been a failure. It hasn't yeah. worked in our country. We tried it and attempted it and it hadn't worked. And, and so everybody wants us to be like the Western. I said, I don't want to be like the Western. They're not so successful. And so that's a whole other plane of, of discussion. And that comes into the, into the peace process now. Uh, whether they start it or not, it's not going to end well. Israel is not going to cave. You know, they just won't. They'll eat up some more time of Obama's term. What do you think about the, uh, the political situation here? Uh, Netanyahu calling about early, early elections in the spring. Uh, the fact that he didn't agree to the conversion agreement that really infuriated some members of, uh, of his yeah. ca cabinet and uh, party. On the left. On the left, left, which was yeah, which was interesting in itself, and then uh, some of the key guys, uh, Sar and some others have uh, have are kind of positioning themselves uh, to be another party, a very yeah. strong Kalan right wing. Also, yes, yes, another one. Yes, very interesting. What do you see, Ted, with uh, the strategy? I mean, BB is a master. Uh, there's so many of us appreciate okay. him, but he's in a difficult situation. Enormous international pressure. You know, we don't favor any. Uh, stopping or any freezing of of, yeah. of community or, or uh, new housing in Judea and Samaria, but as we talked about earlier, he's done that. Um, what do you see coming forward? I mean, here we are at okay. the, uh, the end of, of all, October. First of all, uh, the uh, the the people who really know their stuff say we're not going to have an election that soon. I don't care what you say. Yeah. Because you got to have the parliament or the, the Knesset has to be uh, set for at least two years before you get a pension. Uh, Nothing's going to happen until the two <laughs> years are up. Everybody has to secure their pension. <laughs> That's right? all you have to do, serve two years and you're... you're and then you get, uh, you know, wow. the pension gets better if they serve more. Uh, but that's where you lock in the first level of pension. Very interesting. Nothing happens before well that. Well put. Now, the second thing is this. Uh, Livni and Lapid, who Lapid is center, Livni is a little bit more to the left. Uh, they want to come out and they're insisting on the peace process. They got to be crazy when 75% of the Israeli public are against the peace process. That's going to hurt them in the polls, I think. I think. Now, Bibi's freeze is going to hurt him in election. And what I'm expecting is that he will throw the right a bone. He will make some nice statements and he'll allow a thousand units to go or whatever, try to pacify them uh, in order to show his right-wing credentials. But I think that Bennett is growing stronger and stronger. Yes, I, I think in the polls a few weeks back, uh, Lapid's party was plummeting. Yeah. Uh, Livni probably wouldn't be back in, in the Knesset. So uh, they're not going to really yeah. want elections. Jerusalem home is uh, just keeps getting, right, just keeps increasing in uh, in popularity and approval in connect, potential Knesset seats, and uh, you know right. Lieberman, his party now split with the uh, and, and they're leaning toward aligning with Lapid, and they're leaning toward the peace process, from what I read. But, Lieberman, huh. yeah, but huh. not too many people are covering that. No. So what has Bibi done? One of the things he's done. What's the importance of the conversion bill? Personally. I like the conversion bill. I want to undermine the rabbinate. Why do I like the conversion bill? There's 300,000 Russians who came in on the law of return because they have a relative or whatever that is Jewish. And I don't want to follow Jewish very restrictive law for conversion, which turns the Russians off. And that means their children are not Jewish either. And I say, close your eyes, take all these Russians down to the Jordan, dunk them and say, you're a Jew, you're a Jew, you're a Jew, and then their children can be Jews, right? I want a liberal conversion. This is a nightmare doing this. So that's where I'm standing. But the conversion bill had some amendments that made it halfway house, so to speak, 
And those amendments have been taken out, and it's, it's a balder v version of a liberal uh, notion, which has never been Jewish attitude to conversion. And um, what Bibi did, he went to the uh, Orthodox parties, or Haredi parties, and negotiated a deal with them for the future government, where he wants them in the government because they're more controllable. I'm going to give you whatever money you want and give you whatever rights you want because you're a minority, I can handle that, but you support me. And so they cut a deal on the conversion bill mm -hmm. in order to allow the Orthodox parties to come in and replace Lapid. That's been, that's confirmed that they, I know there was a rumor that they were, had worked a deal. Is it pretty much uh, well, what I happened? Well, I don't think it's signed. Not but, signed, but agreed yeah, to. I, I think it's agreed to. And Bennett is part of that deal, which is interesting. So that's some of the machinations that are going on in terms of looking forward to the next coalition. So uh, as far as election, you don't see the spring, possibly the fall of next year. I don't see a challenge to Bibi. To he'll challenge to Bibi, yeah. I, don't, I think he'll get in again. Um, he's certainly going to remain the head of the party, uh, number one. Um, at the moment, they're calling him for maybe 25 seats. Uh, Bennett won't eclipse him. Yeah, he probably will. High teens, 18, 19. <coughs> it, he's getting stronger. He's getting up there, right. Uh, he's going to replace Lapid's numbers of 19. Uh, and that'll make the right very strong, and it'll all depend on the um, coalition agreement because they wheel and deal in, this, in the coalition agreement. You support this, I support this, this is what our policy will be here. And it's like developing a constitution for a country. Can't you, imagine. You have to agree on the principles that, so that removes a lot of fighting. And so that's what all the negotiations take is to agree on the principles of the coalition. And there's no way Bennett's going to be in the coalition if ho homes are not going to be built uh, east of the Green Line. Right. And that's bad. What about in Jerusalem, even? I mean... It's amazing. I can't imagine being part of a parliamentary government, especially in Israel. I, I just can't believe all the wheeling and dealing that takes place, all the coalition building, all the different factions that are within a majority <laughs> coalition. Uh, it's but amazing. I have to tell you, I'm reading uh, Dick Morris's book. Mm. Uh, what's the name of the book again about about Obama wants to one one party country uh, yeah yeah, yeah. one party I forgot what the title was one party country and Obama for the last couple of years has been harnessing more and more power disregarding the law disregarding the Constitution doing whatever oh, he yeah. wants oh yeah with executive orders and other things doing whatever he wants right so we get to think that Obama is powerful but. Netanyahu is more powerful. This is a shocker. <laughs> Why? Because you have checks and balances. Even although Obama's trying this, yeah. you have checks and balances yeah. in America. Oh, that's right. That's and right. there's no checks and balances here. Yeah, especially if the Republicans get the Senate. It, it'll really be tough. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they'll gird for fighting because they got to fight in order to win 2016. Yeah. So uh, it turns out that... Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, has more power because he can do whatever he wants. There's yeah. nobody to ride herd on him. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Something to think about. <laughs> it is. Ted yeah. Billman, thank you very much. Great having you with us. My pleasure. Thank you. You bet.